Well, I have a message for you this morning. I've titled The Gospel According to Isaiah. The Gospel According to Isaiah. And the Lord has kind of added to that title this morning. Because as I was sitting there, he said, and building on the foundation. Somebody say building on the foundation. Well, the reason why I'm saying this is because we have to, without a shadow of a doubt, understand the moment that we're living. Something precious has happened in this place. And even though the foundation has been laid in this church, and if we go back to the biblical, theological part of it, we understand that the foundation was laid the moment that the Apostle Paul received the revelation of grace. And now I say this not because the other apostles did not um, preach uh, remissions of sin and forgiveness of sins in the Lord Jesus Christ, but remember, they preached to the Jews and to the Hebrews, and they themselves were Hebrews. So in their traditions and in the knowledge that they had, now, they still have a lot of tradition within them. So they had to go uh, through their process so they could finally get to that spot where they could have this revelation. But unlike them, the Apostle Paul got it straight from Jesus. And he got it quickly and he got it good. From the very beginning, from the very moment that the Apostle Paul had this encounter with Jesus, he actually started encountering grace. In fact, the man who prayed for him that his eyes would be open, his name, uh, how many remember? His name actually means, Ananias, his name actually means um, grace. Hana. Hanani. So grace opened his eyes. You see that? His very first encounter was getting his eyes opened by grace. And from that point, he started developing. And then he declared something that I want to use as a foundation for our message today. So go with me first. Before we go to the, the book of Isaiah, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1 and on. And let's read what he has to say first, and then we'll get into the message. Says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as the spiritual people, but as the carnal, as the babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. Somebody say solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. See that? There was a, there was a situation. They were not ready. They were not able to receive it. And then he says, and even now, you're still not able. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, notice the activity that was going on, where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Somebody say mere men. I should start telling you what the Spirit of the Lord wants we, for us to understand as we move on to the next phase from this grace conference. Amen? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, um, it says, are you not carnal? In other words, if you're still at this point, after having heard the gospel of grace, clinging to a particular person because you like the way that they preach, or you like the way that they behave, or the way they handle themselves because you admire the lead leadership, you have completely lost focus of what this is all about. He's saying, look, and he's talking about himself. So not just Apollos and not just, he's saying, who is Paul? He wanted their focus to be particularly on the message that was going to change their lives. In other words, this activity that we've had for so long of following men because of their anointing, the Holy Spirit is saying, that has stopped. Because it's no longer about the anointing of a man. It's about the anointing and the revelation placed on the church. Yeah. So if we're going to move to the next step, we need to use what has happened this weekend and this week as our foundation. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean it hasn't been established. It's just been confirmed. And it's been confirmed strongly that we may continue to build upon it. Somebody say build upon it. Now, you have to understand, when Israel was in Egypt, that was not when they received the revelation of grace. 
In fact, the covenant had been established with Abraham and Jacob and, um, and Isaac and Jacob. So it wasn't new. But for 400 years, they started listening to the wrong message in Egypt and they became slaves to the system. So God didn't come to establish a covenant with them. He came to confirm the covenant that was already established. To bring them into consciousness of what they had so they realized who they were and then they could leave Egypt. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it's very important that we understand that this has been the foundation for us as Christian family to continue forward because this is just the beginning of this call. And you say, man, now watch verse five says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? And then it says, Apollo, and then it says, but ministers, that's what they are, but ministers through whom you believe as the Lord gave to each one. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Somebody say, God gives the increase. I want to tell you what that means. That means God is the one that makes it happen. (laughs) <laughs> we do our part. We're going to give you the revelation. We're going to give you what God has given us. We're going to give you the word. But it's very important that you allow God to give it the growth. You need to allow God to do what he's going to do through the word that's already spoken. Remember, this is not God who's doing something right now. This is God that did something already. It just works whenever you allow it to work. Because God already gave the word. He's already established a plan. He said, it is finished. Now take it and run with it. That's what Paul was saying when he said, work out your salvation. He wasn't saying, try to keep your salvation. He says, work it out. You have it, now get busy. And boy, after what we received this week, I think we need to get busy. Amen. Because we got a lot of things to do, a lot of people to reach. I think that now we understand better than ever that we've been commissioned to change the wrong course that the church of Jesus has been carrying for a long time. Amen? Amen. So this is the first thing I want to establish. I need you to understand what has happened here. There was a confirmation. At times, our minds were blown. At other times, we went into deep consideration, deep meditation of the words that were spoken. But every one of them, whether you realize it or not, these words have already been planted in you. There's something that God has already put in you. You, however, need to understand that that is the foundation. It is from this point forward that God is going to build like never before. We have come thus far, but there is a road and there is grace upon grace that has been assigned for this church, and we need to walk in it. Amen? So listen to the instructions of Paul. Now, Paul is going to teach us how to get this done. He wants us to understand exactly how it works. Let me continue on verse 7. He says, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters. The only thing important here is not the people that are doing it, is the one who's the foundation, who is Jesus Christ. And he says this, but God who gives the increase. The question is, how does the increase come about? That's what we need to get, we need to get established today. So let's continue reading. Verse 8 says, now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So I want you to start positioning yourself in that Rema word. Everybody here has the responsibility to bring this revelation in, allow it to grow within you so that then we can give it out. Every single person here has been assigned to bring this revelation to somebody. But you're not going to be able to bring the revelation to somebody unless you allow it to grow within you. So Paul's going to give us very specific instructions. I want you to follow me now. Listen to this. Verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. Now this is God's way of seeing you. Paul is saying, you are the fellow workers. You are the ones that need to do the mission, fulfill the commission. But listen to the way God sees you. He says, you are God's field. 
So the first thing that we need to analyze is that the principle that we are going to allow to work in our lives in order for us to take this forward is to recognize and understand that we are the field where God is sowing. And unless we understand that, we won't allow him to do so. You need to allow every opportunity in your life, whether it be Thursdays, whether it be Sundays, you need to be here like never before now so God can keep planting in you. Because it's not about, well, once God planted. No, you need to keep planting so you can continue to be reaping. I'm not sure. I'm not sure you're listening yet. We need to understand that this is why the foundation was given. Because God sees us as a field to plant in. It's God the one planting. He calls us the field. Now, he doesn't just call us the field. Listen to this. He calls us his building. It says, you are God's field. You are are God's field, comma. You are God's building, So now you're not just a field, now you're also a building. But here, I want you to understand, I don't want you to see a building for say, like a structure like this. I want you to see it beyond that. I want you to see a building as a construction. What kind? The one that fulfills his mission. Listen to this. You are God's building. In other words, you are what God is working on. God is working in you because he has a design. He has a plan. So we're going to allow him to sow in our field and us as a field so we can understand the design. Because here's the thing, guys. Grace is not just a message. Grace is a spirit in itself. The Bible calls even the Holy Spirit as the spirit of grace. And if you want to understand what spirit is, I want you to try to look at it from this point of view. Spirit is the very essence of everything. It's like if you go to a computer and you talk about a program. When we say we have received the Holy Spirit, you know what we have received? The very essence and program of God's design. So he's saying you are the building. You are what God is building. You are the thing that God is working on. God's got one thing in his heart and in his mind and is working in you. And the reason why he wants to work in you is because he wants to be able to bring his children back home. Now, the biggest thing that we talked about this week, and it's something that we continue to speak of in all the messages, is this. That the message of grace is intended to allow you and God to come back to an intimate relationship. And we now understand that as long as there is guilt and condemnation, that will never be. So the purpose we read in the book of Hebrews, the purpose of God through the sacrifice was to remove the sin completely. Not to forgive it, but to remove it. So he has forgiven us, but he didn't just forgive us. He totally removed all of our sins. That is the past, the present, and the future. So there's no longer anything that can stand in your way when it comes to having intimacy with God, because as far as God is concerned, sin is no longer in the way. So the objective is to clear the consciousness so you no longer have an impediment when it comes to allowing God to plant in your field. (laughs) Not only to plant in your field, but to build His building. Can you say praise the Lord? You realize that God has chosen you, church, to do this? And I say this very particular. I'm not just talking about the church of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about Christian family. We've been called for something so precious, so big, so immense. I'm I'm sure sometimes we don't get it completely. But we're getting there, right? Listen to this. Verse 10. According... To the grace of God. Somebody says, according to the grace of God. So here's the foundation again. He's saying, we are all fellow workers. 
You are feet, a field of God. You are the field. You are the building of God. You're what God is working on. And everything he's doing is according to the grace of God. So the grace message is what God wants to use. The grace of the finished work of the cross is what God wants to use both to plant in the field and to build the building. And he says, as a wise master builder, I, this is now Paul speaking, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Now you understand why Paul would call it his gospel. Remember, if you read the other epistles of the apostles, you're going to realize that they're different from Paul's because Paul was a very radical grace teacher. He understood that if you're going to build upon the foundation laid, it had to be done with the revelation of grace only. I'm about to prove that to you because that's the whole purpose. You cannot allow that from this point on, you go on and let religion or any other thought or teaching of human effort invade your life. Yeah. Come on. It is important that we recognize that the only thing that can build the life of a, of a son or daughter of God to the level of success where you can see the things that you've always expected and always believed from his promises, you must have your life built with grace. There are good messages and there are good topics to speak about, but they all have a moment. What Paul says, it's important and necessary to build your life for success, that you may reign in life, as he says, you must receive abundance of grace. So listen to what advice he gives us. Again, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds. Tell your neighbor next to you, he's talking about you. Another builds on it, but let each one take heed. That means be careful how you're going to do it. Let everyone be careful. Take notice. Concentrate on how. Somebody say how. He builds. Now we're not talking about what we built. The foundation is already laid. Amen. So we, 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 we have... We have the foundation. We know it's God's building. We know it's about grace. The issue now is how you're going to handle grace. How, see, is grace going to become a topic for you or is grace going to be the foundation for you? How are you going to handle it for your own life and how are you going to handle it when you give it to others? Are others going to see radical grace in your life? Or are they going to see a regular message? See, remember, for a long time, the concentration of the Christian was to show others about our testimony. And we were doing very wrong because obviously our testimony does not meet the mark. So we were failing miserably. And the world has said, I don't want to go to church because I'm already like them. And I'm good here. If I go to church and I got to be a hypocrite in church, I'm not going to enjoy it. At least let me be a hypocrite out here when I'm having fun. <laughs> so we need to see how we're going to build because now it's about bringing the revelation in our lives, through our lives for them to see. Not our testimony. Jesus said, I, have, I am calling you to be witnesses of me. And you shall be witnesses of me when the power of the Spirit of grace has come upon you. So listen to the instructions of God how we are supposed to build. This is fantastic. You're, you're, there are things that until we get the foundation, we don't see in the Bible. You're never going to forget this again. Let's get into it. We're in verse um, 10 again. Uh, I want to read verse 11. Now, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid. And the foundation is Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, somebody say, if anyone builds on this foundation. The different materials that Paul is about to give us are not the materials that he says you need to use them all. What he's saying is, if you do build with these materials, you have to choose what and how you're going to build with. 
and what they represent. So that doesn't mean everyone that he mentions is what you need to build with. What it means is, look, I'm going to tell you what normally people build with. You need to choose what you're going to build with. Amen? So listen again. It says, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones. Somebody say gold. Silver. Precious stones. Now it gives you another three. Now it says, or wood, hay, or straw. Each one's work will be clear. Meaning, whatever you do from now on with this grace message is going to be evident in your life. <laughs> so if you're building with the right materials, your prosperity will be shown. If you're building with the right materials, your healing will be seen. In other words, God is saying, listen to me. If you build right, now we're not talking about the foundation. Remember, it's been established. If you continue to build on the foundation, the evidence is going to be real. Because we're no longer treating grace as a topic. We're treating grace in its foundation. That means that whatever we do now will have evidence. will show a result. You need to know that if you build with the right materials, it's not about hoping it will happen to you. I'm tired of the messages that used to build our hope and our hope. And every Sunday we go to church and we get hope, hope. But then we go back and we're still questioning, why isn't it happening in my life? And I believe it's because we were treating grace like a topic, not like the foundation. So Paul says and gives you these materials. Let's go with the first one. The first one is gold. Now, please understand, wherever you read gold in the Bible, it speaks of righteousness. Gold is the very character of God. So wherever you read gold is righteousness. And righteousness not by works, righteousness by imputation. Meaning, it's the attribution of God to you. God will give you the result, the credit of his own righteousness. So God, Paul is saying, listen, if you're going to now build on the foundation, make sure that your message, your confession, and everything you allow in your life to be based on the righteousness given to you. See, he's not talking about behaving right. That's been a problem. We've always concentrated on behavior, behavior, behavior. After all the talk on behavior, and the church is still behaving worse than ever. I don't think it works, does it? <laughs> because when you concentrate on behavior, you're concentrating on the law. And the law is the strength of sin. So the more that you concentrate on behavior, the more you're going to be enticed or stirred to committing the same sins. So make sure you start building on the foundation of imputed righteousness, the gift that was given to you. Second, he says silver. Now in the Bible, wherever you read silver, always talks about redemption. Can you understand it? There's certain things I can't go into the Bible to show you, but at least for now, until you go home and study it, I need you to understand it. So, so uh, righteousness is one thing, so, um, silver is redemption. Gold is righteousness, silver is redemption. And the third thing that he speaks of is precious stones. Now, this is the part that I don't know if I've ever shared with you, but I really want you to see this because this is going to bring it home for you. In the system that God had established with Israel called the law, he also established a system within the law, which was called the Levitical order. The Levitical order was in order to have a shadow that would speak of grace in the midst of a people that were under a law. So God established a system that literally spoke of the finished work of the cross. And one of them is the position of the high priest. So the high priest had a particular vesture on that God had ordained. And in all that garment that he wore... Everything that he had spoke of the realities of grace. And the one thing that stood out the most was called the breastplate of righteousness, by the way. And I want you to understand something. In it, there was a gold plate, which is righteousness, and there were precious stones attached to it. Literally 12 of them. Which means, and by the way, they had the names of the tribes. So in essence, it's us. Because it represented the tribes. The names were engraved. They were not written with a sharpie. 
When something is engraved in a stone, you can't erase it after that. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And they were put in gold because it's righteous, which means you were planted in righteousness. Whenever the high priest would do his job, which was to come in to the presence of God once a year with the blood of the Lamb, the Bible says the Shekinah glory, the light of God would shine in front of him in the Ark of the Covenant. Which means you can all try to imagine this. The high priest with all the vestures and these precious stones in his breastplate. And all of a sudden the light of God shines like nothing shines. And when the light hits the precious stones, what happens to the stones? Do they look uglier? No, they look shinier, more beautiful. The very beauty of the stones is pronounced, comes out. The truth of the work of the finished cross comes out. So when you approach the light, the light is not there to show your sins. The light is there to show your beauty in Christ. Come on, give the Lord a clap off. So Paul is speaking to both ministers and all the workers. So whether you are a preacher or whether you are someone who just started out and your intention is to preach the gospel, listen to me. This is what he's saying. Make sure that your message is based on the righteousness of God that was given to us. On the fact that we have been redeemed from our sins. Like I said, we haven't been forgiven. Our sins have been removed forever. And make sure that when you tell people the way God sees them, that they can see themselves like precious stones before God. That's the message. In fact, look at this. This is the second part. He said, don't build with wood. Wood speaks of human effort. Don't build with hay. Hay speaks of vanity, things that are light. They have no weight in it. Don't build with straw, which, by the way, in, in, in other translations, is translated to stubble. And it really stands for dead works or dead religion. So you see how simple? It's really not complicated. Paul is saying, this is the way you need to build. If you want to see people going forward and working and looking at the work of God manifested in their lives, all you have to do is choose the right materials. Come on. And God is saying, these are the materials that when people start hearing that that's what they are, in and in of itself, the work and the construction of God will start manifesting. Now listen to verse 13. Each one's work will be clear. Say clear. Have you not gone through this experience ever since you understood the message and the revelation of grace? It's like the gospel is making sense to you finally. I mean, there was a time when I... I, I didn't talk about things that I could not understand. They didn't make any sense to me, and I definitely didn't want to offend God. God doesn't need to be helped. It's just that we never preach the right revelation. So he says, listen, there's a time coming. The day is coming where your work will be declared. Because it will be revealed, listen to this, by fire. Now, we're not talking about the end time when the people are going to be judged by God. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your daily life. Every week, every day when you go out there, you're going to be confronted with all kinds of oppositions, all kinds of situations. And if you have not built your life with abundance of grace, you're not going to have the victory that you have been assigned to manifest. So he's saying, listen, the reason why you want to build this way is because you live in the real world. You're going to be confronting these realities constantly. So he says, listen, if anyone works which he has built on it endures, he will receive reward. Somebody say he will receive it. Do you hear what Paul is saying to you or the Spirit is saying? He says it's not a maybe. He's saying, listen, if you build with the right materials, you will be blessed. I I'm not sure if you really want to be blessed yet. If you build with the right materials, you will be blessed. If anyone's works is burned, and that's evidence that he built with the wrong materials. And Paul says, listen, you're going to suffer loss. 
So you can't question yourself anymore when something doesn't work right. What you need to do is say, you know what? Let's stop questioning that and let's focus on what am I building with? What are the materials that I'm using? And how am I building it? It's not just the materials. It's how am I using them? Am I being radical enough because I believe radically in grace? Pastor, you don't understand. I'm going through a lot of things. What are you doing about it? Oh, pastor, you don't understand. I'm sick. What are you doing about it? Did you know that there are materials in the Bible that have been offered to you so that you can do something about it? Abraham came to, to the Lord and said, Lord, how do I know that I'm going to receive this? And the Lord answered, bring me five different types of animals. I'm not going to get deep into it. I can right now. But he said, bring me five different types of animals. And every one of those animals spoke of a facet of the life of the finished work on the cross of Jesus. There were five of them. That's the number of grace. You know what, in essence, God was saying to him? And if you all know the story, you know that Paul divided those animals in half. I'm, I'm sorry, Abraham. He divided the animals in half, and then he fell asleep. And God said, that's good because I don't need you in this, this thing. This, this thing I'm about to do in order to answer your question and giving you a surety of how you're going to receive the blessing. I don't need you here. In fact, if you're in the way, if you're here, you're going to be in the way. So he fell asleep and the Bible says that all of a sudden somebody, a light started burning and walking in between those animals that were divided. And the reason why is because God is really answering Abraham, telling him, let me show you the real reason why you're going to get blessed. You're not going to get blessed because you're obedient. You're not going to get blessed because you can do it the right way. You're going to get blessed because Jesus was the one walking in the middle of those animals. And God was establishing a covenant, not with men, but a covenant with Jesus. Five animals. It was the number of grace. You know what he was saying? If you want to know the truth about the results, remind me of my son. Bring me a sacrifice that speaks to me of my son. Now, remember, we spoke about it this week. Our Bishop McClinton told us how the sacrifice has already been done. So now all that God wants is for us to be, rem to be remembering what he did for us. Jesus said, whenever you take the bread, whenever you take the wine, remember, have memory of what I did for you. So what are you doing about getting blessed? How radical are you getting about grace? Are you getting up every day, maybe taking communion in your own house? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think I lost them, Pastor. You see, you see, you drink vitamins every morning. And you, you, try to, you try to bring health to your body. But I want to tell you something even better. You take communion every day. It's better than vitamins every day. Because every time you're doing that, you're reminding God, listen, Lord, this is why I can be blessed. Because Jesus died for me at the cross. This is why I can be blessed, because the blood was shed. I have the legal right to stand in your presence. I can enter boldly, because I am a son of God. Come on, somebody. I don't know if I'm going to get to a quarter of the message today, Pastor. <laughs> Go with me quickly till I say I'm 54. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 54. Here's what I came to tell you this morning. I want you to know that this is real. It wasn't just about getting excited on a revelation. It's about you analyzing what happened to you when you were hearing the revelation. Every time one of the men of God in this, uh, in this place came and gave us a word of grace, you felt the stirring. You felt something happening within. Ever since you've been receiving this message here, you know that every time you hear the word, faith gets built in you. 
So imagine if you treated radically and you start listening to this word and accepting your position in Christ. This is what God wants you to know. This is verse 1 in Isaiah 54. It says, sing, O barren. This is what the gospel of grace is according to Isaiah. Now, please understand that everything I'm about to read to you, it comes right after chapter 53. I know you haven't understand what I said yet. Chapter 53 in the book of Isaiah is the, um, the revelation of the death of Jesus Christ. So after the death of Jesus Christ, then comes the resurrection and the result of what he did. So verse 1 says, sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry out loud, you who have not labored with child. For more, somebody say more. more. More are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, saith the Lord. Amen. Now, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Amen. Do you believe that the sons, the children, the offspring of the one that could not bear forth children will be more than the one that could? The one that could was Israel. The one that couldn't was the Gentiles. And the reason why is because we had no husband. And we were barren because of the curse. So God is saying, if you are going to have more children than the one that was under covenant, that means, number one, that the covenant you're about to receive is a better covenant with better promises. <laughs> And he wants you to understand, if you have anybody in the Old Testament that you admired and said, oh, wow, what a great blessing. Let me tell you something, church. Your blessing is way better than that one. I don't care what you saw in the Old Testament. If it impressed you, I want you to know the least in the kingdom is greater than any one of the Old Testament. So verse 2, God says, if that is so, if you believe this, Pastor Perry, if we believe this, this is what God says, enlarge your place, enlarge the place of your tent. We need to bring this message and this revelation to a larger scenario, to a larger place. We need to take it to another level. Do you believe that Jesus died for you at the cross? Do you believe the message of the cross? God is saying, enlarge the place of your tent. And let them stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Yeah. See, you don't, you don't see it yet, but this place is too small, Pastor. This place is too small. If you could see the vision, if you could see what God is building, you would understand this place is too small. We just got a taste. That's all we've had. It's a taste of what's about to happen. God says, don't spare. This, this is what I love about the pastor's testimony. He said, he was about to say no, and God said, yes, don't spare. And you know what? You were rewarded, sir. And we were rewarded because of you. We've been blessed because somebody had the courage to say yes to what God did at the cross of Calvary. Come on. <laughs> Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. I really don't have the time, but every one of those things actually has a meaning. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will be in, will be inherit will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Tell your neighbor you will not be ashamed. You know what that means? That means that what you are believing for, because God promises, you're going to get it. You know, it came to a point where there are Christians who actually don't like to talk about the promises because they're afraid that somebody's going to tell them, yeah, well, what about you? Hello? You know, that's why you're all so quiet, because you know. Yeah. We were ashamed. We didn't know. It hasn't happened to me. I believe in healing, yet I'm sick. I believe in prosperity, and yet I can't even pay my rent. And God is saying, that's not the way it's going to be. 
This is not your usual message. This is the revelation of the finished work of the cross. Do not fear. You will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced. That means the grace given to you will not be taken away. For you will not be put to shame. For you will, for you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. Yeah. Yeah. I have to explain it. I have to explain it. And I'm going to finish in a couple minutes. Listen to this. I need to explain this to you. The reason why it's so important to understand what he means when he says, for I am your husband, is because before you came to Jesus, you were married to the law. And because you were married to the law, the law could never allow you to bear children. Because you were not qualified. You were unclean. You never met the demands of the law. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with the law. It wasn't the law that was barren. If you could fulfill the law, you would have had children with the law. So nothing wrong with the law. Paul says the law is perfect, holy. The problem is us. So, Jesus, so here's what God is saying. You no longer have the limitations you used to have. Because the husband you had before didn't allow intimacy. That's why you couldn't have any, any type of action. You would have no intimacy. He said, I, I can't. The law does not allow defilement. The law does not allow any dead thing to touch him. All of a sudden, Jesus came in the scene. And the people that were unclean started touching him. But he could not be stained. He could not be undefiled. And everyone who came to Jesus and touched him or was touched by him had intimacy. And all of a sudden, the barrenness would go away and the blessings would come forth. Yeah. So here's what he's saying. You're not married to the law anymore. The reason why you could be assured of your blessing is because you are now married to him. And he took care of your condition. You're not who you used to be. If you're in Christ, I want you to be, I want you to know you are a new creation. All things have passed away. He has made you new. You now qualify to be with him and to produce children because he has given you the credit like if you had fulfilled the law yourself. So even the blessings of the law cannot be denied to you. So he wants you to know this is the reason. The Lord of hosts is his name and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a, like a joyful wife when you were refused, saith God. For a mere moment, somebody say, that already happened. For a mere moment, I have forsaken you, but with great mercies. And the word there, by the way, in the Hebrew is hased, which means grace. So he's saying, with great grace, I will gather you. With the revelation of grace, I will gather you. With the revelation of grace, I will rebuild you. With the revelation of grace, I will heal you. With the revelation of grace, I don't know, I I'm not sure you're listening today. With the message of the finished work at the cross, I'm going to take you to the next level. For a mere moment. But with the revelation of grace, I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have grace on you, saith the Lord, your Redeemer. And we finish with this. Listen to this. I want you to jump with me to verse 10. Oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems. 
Somebody say colorful gems. Now you have to understand what he's saying. He says, I'm going to lay your stones. That means this is how God is now building the building. God is saying, I'm going to make you look good. <laughs> with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphire. Now, for those of you that want to understand what that means, sapphire in its color looks like fire. So God is saying your foundation will be based on the message of the cross. Remember, it was at the cross that Jesus received all the fire and judgment that came upon him. So God is saying that's going to be your foundation. But if that is your foundation, then God can also decorate your life with all, with grace upon grace upon grace. That's what it means, all these colorful gems. And then look at what he says. And I will even make your pinnacles of rubies of rubies and your gates of crystal. Pinnacles there, the original word actually translates to windows. So to finish, listen to what he's saying to you. And all your walls of precious stones. Here's what the Lord is saying. And pastor, this is a message God has given us as pastors. God is saying to you, if you continue to listen to this message, your foundation will be based on the finished work of the cross. But I'm going to decorate your life with precious stones and everything of value. That even when you look through the window, you will have no choice but to see the beauty of God's work in your life. Everywhere you look, God says, I'm going to decorate it with beauty. That, that's what he's doing. That's the building. He's building you to an extent where no matter where you look in the revelation of grace, you will have no option but to see yourself sitting at the right hand of majesty with the Father. When, when John saw Jesus in the book of Revelation, the Bible says he even saw a rainbow around the throne. And in the very gospel, and I don't have the time, the Lord says, for it shall be unto me. God is saying, it will be this whole process. It will be unto me what Jesus did at the cross. It will be unto me like in the days of Noah. Where I will never, ever be angry at you again. Everywhere you look, God's about to make your life where the message of grace and the beauties of what he did at the cross will be what edifies you, builds you up. And church, listen to me. God is calling you to be like no one else because he's given you this message now because he's going to use you to reach the rest of the Christians and the rest of the world. Can you say amen and give the Lord a mighty clap up in Pastor Paris? Hallelujah.